All righty. Uh, good afternoon. We're going to re-record this uh, webinar that we hosted on March 20th, uh, sorry, March 7th, had a little snafu with uh, probably my my doing with recording and um, saving the presentation. So we're gonna gonna re-record it. So just uh, you know, we have a question, questions and answers that we'll um, send out a reply at the end. Just a reminder that each of these uh, webinars that we do put on qualify for uh, 1.0 PDH uh, credits. Uh, we have a survey uh, afterwards that you've already filled out. Appreciate that. Helps us with uh, planning and uh, answering questions that we might have missed. Um, just want to thank uh, Gianna Salvatore and Rick uh, Gadayas for helping with me with this. So anyway, let's get uh, started with our re-recording here. So uh, for today's uh, agenda, um, I probably uh, mislabeled uh, this uh, presentation as basics of water source heat pumps. Um, do have only like an hour time, so wanted to try to pick out uh, items that might be of interest or just as a reminder for uh, you know our customers regarding water source heat pumps. So just today's agenda, going to do a quick review of water source heat pumps like I typically do. Uh, some other food for thought is, uh, did you ever consider a single pipe systems for water source heat pumps instead of a dual pipe? Um, with all HVAC systems, you're worried about dehumidification. You have two choices here for dehumidifying your spaces. You can either do it at the water source heat pump level or else you can also do it at uh, your, your dedicated outside air uh, system. Going to just quickly touch on geothermal and hybrid systems. Uh, going to spend a couple minutes reviewing the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was uh, implemented in 2022. Uh, and then, like we always do, um, you know, at HCNI slash Gilbar here, we're selling, uh, trying to sell you systems, not just equipment, but just a quick review of what products we do have available and what systems we do have available. All right, so first part here, just going a quick review of what is a water source heat pump. On the left, you have a simple vertical uh, water source heat pump. It has a refrigeration circuit. You have uh, air with your uh, Q with uh, cooling mode, you have heat. That air gets crossed, uh, passes across a evaporated coil, gets cooled. You have a subsequent refrigeration system. In that refrigeration system, you have a compressor. You have a, a reversing valve to reverse our uh, refrigerant flow. In this situation, there's a water-cooled uh, condenser, and then there's a TXV for your uh, pressure reduction as well as your uh, uh, metering as your metering device. So that's in the cooling mode, removing heat from the air, dumping it into the refrigeration system, and then you're expelling the heat from the refrigeration system uh, externally with a, a water loop of some type. And then what happens in the winter time is the opposite is that we're taking the heat from the water loop, we're dumping it into our refrigeration system, and then we're passing the room air uh, across our evaporator. This time it's a condenser coil, but essentially we're heating the air with the refrigerant. And that's uh, how the water source heat pump uh, works. Just what makes this different is that um, we are adding uh, you know, the coaxial, the, the water to water heat exchanger is typically a coaxial on the larger size or it's a plate. And then just as a reminder, in the heating mode, we are adding additional energy or heat to refrigeration system by operating the compressor. Uh, typical arrangement is you have multiple zones, uh, multiple units with the water source heat pumps. You have them connected to a uh, distribution piping. You have a circulating pump and then down at the bottom there, you have a boiler or some type of device that's adding heat to the loop. And then you also have a uh, device that's, uh, you know, in this case here, it's calling it a fluid cooler where we're removing heat from the loop. The loop. And then just realize that, um, you know, th uh, today a lot of systems are not using a boiler and cooling tower. We'll talk a little bit more about that with geothermal. Uh, just the water source heat pumps themselves. They come in every, many different flavors, many different styles. The picture shown there, uh, upper left is small horizontal or vertical units. The upper right is a vertical stacked one that you would see like in a high rise, like a condo or a dorm. 
You have the white ones, the consoles. There's a uh, the lower right is a large indoor unit, and then you do have also rooftop units. And then just to, uh, you know, uh, tie this in, you know, we do rep climate master that do have all these different types of water source heat pumps. So how does it operate in the summertime where you're trying to cool the uh, building? You have your units in cooling. What you'll do, do then is make sure that your boiler is off and then you have your fluid cooler that you're rejecting the uh, energy, the heat that you've removed from the system to the, uh, you know, to the outdoors or to, to an external uh, source. The opposite happens in the wintertime where we have a need for heating within the space. In this situation, the boiler is on to add heat uh, to the loop. That loop then transfers the heat to the water source heat pumps. And then as the previous slide shows, we're um, adding heat uh, to the uh, airstream and therefore heating then heating the space. So what happens in the shoulder seasons where there's spring and fall operation, where you'll have uh, you know, multiple iterations of some units in cooling and some units in heating. In this situation here, you won't have to run your boiler or cooling tower or else you will have a reduced operation. And then what will happen is basically we'll move the heat from the cooling units, dump them into the water loop, and then they get transferred to the units that are in heating. Uh, this is also happens with a uh, building. This is a plan view of a, uh, uh, say an office building, where you have interior exterior zones. So in the winter time, the uh, exterior zones are requiring heating, but then the indoor section of the interior zones, because of all the lights and uh, people load, um, there's no heat loss through the uh, floor or the ceiling or windows. Um, that uh, core load is oftentimes in a, a year round cooling. What ends up happening is once again, we're removing the heat from that center interior zone and then dumping it into the exterior. This is another situation where uh, you know we're we're operating in a very efficient uh, manner. In this situation, we're just transferring energy. We're not spending, uh, you know, we're not having to create energy by running our boiler. The advantages of water source heat pumps, everybody's familiar with it. They're typically very high, highly efficient. We're using water as a heat transfer medium versus air. So you have a lower condensing temperature. Uh, you have multiple units for zoning. This allows simultaneously heating and cooling as well as some redundancy. You have a lot of flexibility with your different types of units where they can be indoors and outdoors, large and small capacities. They're typically simple to control. A lot of times you'll just have, you can just have a simple uh, programmable thermostat controlling the water source heat pump. And then you have a separate uh, loop controller that essentially keeps the loop temperatures between you know, approximately 70 and 95 degrees. Uh, other benefits uh, from an owner tenant perspective, is you can have individual billing, it's easy to expand as a shell and core for future fit outs. And then once again, for renovations, it's very easy to swap out a uh, heat pump for maintenance. Um, also too, if you have to renovate a, an area, you don't have a lot of equipment or a lot of big, big ductwork and piping to rework. The disadvantages typically of water source heat pumps have to do with a, a traditionally a higher first cost. And then if you do on your loop, if you do have an open system, you are gonna to have to incorporate some type of water maintenance, just the uh, as the water is outdoors and then evaporates and such like that, it leaves behind uh, you know, chemicals and impurities and stuff like that. Um, you, know, you have an open system that's exposed to the atmosphere too, getting you know, dirt and, and dust, et cetera, like that inside of it. A couple of just interesting slides that I found from back in my carrier days. So this uh, gives a, a pie graph just showing the, the types of water source heat pumps and uh, the approximate uh, numbers or percentages. Uh, at, you know, so there's horizontal, the vertical ones are uh, small vertical ones uh, shown in the lower left or the stacks that I mentioned that go into high rises, such as condos and uh, dorm rooms, et cetera, like that. Consoles, rooftops, energy recovery, water to water. Uh, just the majority of the market is horizontal, uh, followed by vertical and console. And then like the rooftop slash uh, engine recovery and the water to units are, um, you know, on the pie chart, they might be the crumbs that are on the side of the uh, pie as, a, as an old carrier joke. Um, so anyway, so this is the types of water source heat pumps. 
practice traditionally, the market is a uh, five ton and under. Um, it's got to be three quarters of the water, amount of water source heat pumps are sold. Uh, you know, most commonly these are used in uh, offices, et cetera, like that, um, that uh, lend themselves to uh, numerous small units instead of having uh, large floor by floor units, et cetera, like that. The piping arrangement, just to uh, what's typically done is there's a two pipe system. Uh, it can be different arrangements with uh, whether it's a reverse return or a, a direct return. Uh, just uh, what's shown there on the left is a typical two pipe system that would be a uh, reverse return. Um, but you can also incorporate water source heat pumps with a single pipe system where you have one main that runs around and then you have individual branch pipes to each water source heat pumps. That branch piping takes from and then dumps back into that uh, main circulating loop. Uh, so two pipe versus single pipe. What you do is at the uh, individual water source heat pumps, you have a uh, small branch piping, and then instead of a control valve, you have a small circulating pump. All right, the benefits of the single pipe system, uh, the main benefit is you'll have uh, significantly lower first cost because you're running uh, less pipe. Um, you'll have the same uh, heating performance, whether this is a two pipe system or a four pipe system at the same, when I say the the heating and cooling performance at the zone level. Uh, and then uh, because you're running, the uh, the main pump is just sized to handle the loop and the smaller uh, you know, booster pumps or uh, zone pumps are just to handle the uh, branch piping. You end up downsizing your main circulating pump and saving uh, energy. Just the system is mentioned in the ASHRAE handbook uh, that I've shown there. And then just as a uh, you know, food for thought or a little teaser, uh, just the next webinar that I'm going to put on on April 25th, that's a Tuesday, um, we'll be on uh, talking about single pipe systems and single pipe hydronic systems. They can be used for fan coil units as well as for uh, water source heat pump systems. All right. So back to our uh, other uh, understanding or just concerns with water source heat pumps, uh, you do have to handle or just be worried about dehumidification control. As I mentioned, there's two methods to do this. Option one is at the water source heat pump. We have two uh, main uh, choices available. The first one is hot gas reheat, where we're taking essentially, everybody's familiar with the hot gas reheat coil. We're essentially adding a, a second coil in the airstream that's reheating the air from the compressor um, to provide neutral air. Uh, the, the benefit of this system is that it's relatively inexpensive. The, the downside is that you could have or might have more refrigerant charge. Uh, typically, uh, water source heat pumps um, have on-off control for that hot gas uh, reheat for dehumidification control. And then a lot of times at the uh, part load conditions where you're not removing a lot of energy from your uh, airstream. You don't really have uh, a sufficient, sufficient amount of reheat available um, you know, in those part load conditions. The second option is to add a uh, hydronic coil that's hooked up to the condenser water system. Uh, it's circled there on the right. This is in the reheat position. You have uh, a little circulating pump you have a little uh, you know, uh, hydronic coil. Um, what you're doing is you're using the condenser water temperatures that are at uh, say 95 or 85 or 75 uh, degrees or so to reheat the air. The, down, the benefits of this system is that um, you don't have uh, you know, additional refrigerant charge. You can get some modulating capacity control for better uh, comfort. And then in addition, you can have uh, you know, additional reheat capacities at your full load and part load conditions. The downside of this system is that traditionally it's more expensive than the hot gas reheat system. And then you are adding a, a very small circulating pump at each of the, um, each of the water source heat pumps. Uh, second option, instead of at the water source heat pump level is to add it uh, for your dedicated outside air system. On the right there is shown a traditional, you know, simple dedicated outside air system that brings outside air uh, into 
the zones for each of the water source heat pumps. They could be uh, piped, uh, you know, as they shown here in series with the water source heat pumps. They could also be, uh, you know, uh, ducted directly to the space. Uh, this DOAS unit uh, has a lot of possibilities, uh, you know, flexibilities of where it's located. Um, uh, you can add energy recovery devices to satisfy your energy codes. Um, very easy to add dehumidification control. Uh, you can traditionally get better, uh, higher fil filters, better filtration effect than you traditionally can do with a, a water source uh, heat pump system. I'm uh, going to recommend that uh, out of these two options here that you uh, go down the path or explore or try to use the uh, DOAS unit for dehumidification control. Uh, reason for that is um, we want to dedicate, we want to remove the moisture at the outside air source. Uh, traditionally, water source heat pumps as well as some other terminal equipment that I've shown there. So strength is not latent cooling removal. A lot of times these units just have, uh, you know, two or three row uh, 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 evaporator coils, not much uh, you know, extra cooling. With the DOAS unit, you can decouple your latent on cooling load. It, like I said, it's easy to add energy recovery. If you have a refrigerant-based uh, rooftop or a DOAS unit, it's very easy to implement the hot gas reheat for dehumidification control. Uh, it's done all the time, uh, very inexpensive in these uh, package units. Uh, and then for your uh, DOAS unit, you do have choices where for your leaving air temperature, you can provide uh, design for neutral air, which is traditionally around the same uh, dew point or leaving air temperature as the room. But then in addition, you can uh, provide, uh, oversize your unit or increase the size of your unit to provide uh, additional latent cooling uh, that would help with um, uh, humidity control or relative humidity levels in your spaces. And then also that DOAS unit, it's easy to satisfy uh, your uh, 62.1 code for indoor air quality. Uh, just further emphasizing these next couple of slides are, are repeats that I've gone over in the past. Uh, just uh, for a traditional space, there are traditional, the, the four main components of your cooling load is you know a from your outside air where you have uh, latent cooling as well as sensible once again everybody's aware that latent cooling is associated with moisture and then in addition your space has latent uh, cooling load as well as sensible because what we're seeing over time is that uh, because of improvements with um, you know lights uh, computers uh, building envelopes and such like that your sensible uh, cooling in your space is kind of decreasing over time as a uh, percentage of your total overall uh, cooling load. Um, just what we find is that the latent cooling that's associated with the outside air is your uh, most critical. And then this next slide, once again, is a reheat peak, just, but just to emphasize once again, that your latent cooling uh, from your outside air is uh, traditionally overwhelms or just much more uh, you know, greater in, in, in capacity versus your other cooling loads. And this is taken from the ASHRAE uh, handbook uh, shown there, mentioned there down on the left. So um, next couple of slides is talk about some alternative heating and, and heating and uh, heat rejection devices. So instead of traditionally using the boiler and cooling tower that's shown there, uh, everybody's aware of geothermal water source heat pump systems. The geothermal also go by ground source or geo exchange uh, reference you know, section in the ASHRAE uh, handbook there on the upper uh, right. Traditionally, what these are doing is they uh, down below the building or in uh, you know out in a, a football field, et cetera, like that at a school. They run uh, uh, you know tubing or uh, make wells and they use the ground as a heat source and as well as a heat sink. Uh, these these piping systems are traditionally a closed loop. Um, just uh, they can come in vertical and horizontal orientations. Uh, just try to emphasize that the vertical ones shown on the left are the majority of the uh, projects as they take up less uh, space than the horizontal. Uh, get better performance traditionally versus a small horizontal system. And then a subset of the geothermal systems have to do with a ground 
our surface water system uh, just you know shown or depicted there on the right and then these can be either open or closed uh, systems if you do have an open system you have to be concerned about uh, you know water quality uh, well-known benefits of geothermal uh, you have very low life cycle cost associated with uh, energy uh, maintenance longer equipment life uh, once again emphasizing you're new you're using the earth so it's a renewable energy uh, source not using uh, natural gas or electric to heat your water architects like these because of a smaller mechanical room and then as well as not having the need for outdoor equipment that always has aesthetics and uh, sound uh, concerns and then the drawback for geothermal systems once again that everybody's very familiar with is they uh, have a, a much larger first cost because you have to uh, you know, create or make the well field versus a traditional uh, boiler uh, tower system. So here's a way to, to minimize or just try to reduce the impact of that geothermal system. There's a type called the hybrid geothermal system that has lower first cost. What you're doing is you're installing still a, geotherm a traditional geothermal system, but you're adding a heat rejection device. So there you have your geothermal system and then just depicting you have a uh, cooling tower or a uh, dry cooler to reject heat. So in this situation, the, the uh, geothermal well field is typically uh, sized for your cooling load. Uh, more often than not on these systems, the cooling load is the dominant uh, system or the do dominant mode versus heating because we're associated with uh, you know, the location on three quarters of the uh, southern part of the United States. You have a lot of solar uh, load, people, internal lighting, et cetera, like that, and then also dehumidification requirements. So in the hybrid system, what you'll do is you'll size the well field for your winter operation. Therefore, it will be smaller. And then in the summertime, you're going to operate the well field. But then in addition, you're going to uh, operate the heat rejection device. Next slide here just kind of depicts so in the summertime, you're rejecting heat to the geothermal loop as well as your heat reduction uh, device. And then in the winter time, you're uh, just getting, you don't have a boiler system to uh, inject heat into the uh, loop. You're just getting the um, energy from your geothermal uh, uh, well field uh, here. So different types of heat rejection uh, systems. Uh, first one is just a cooling tower with a plate and frame. You could have a dry cooler. There's one shown there that's horizontal. They also come obviously in uh, uh, vertical and V-bank um, arrangements. You have a third one is a fluid cooler where you have, uh, in this situation, you have water. You have a closed circuit cooling tower. You have uh, the, the water through the loop going through a heat exchanger. And then you're spraying uh, water uh, you know, over the uh, coil there. And then in addition, um, you know, typically the dry cooler is less expensive than, um, you know, the, the fluid cooler because you're, um, you know, adding the, the water and the sump, you have a higher uh, uh, first cost, but therefore they are, uh, because of your, uh, the water um, being sprayed across the heat exchanger, you have, uh, you know, lower uh, evaporating temperature, so therefore they're more efficient. But then obviously, because you do have the open loop or the additional water loop, you do have more maintenance. Okay, next select, couple slides, gonna just uh, touch on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed uh, last year uh, by Congress. Uh, just, uh, you know, I've taken most of this information, trying to just condense it in 15 minutes. Uh, you know, Climate Master uh, has a webinar, um, you know, an hour long webinar that, um, you know, talks in more in depth about this. There's a link for it in the bottom. And then uh, from that link there, Climate Master does have a uh, geothermal tax incentive uh, guide that's available uh, for free. You just have to uh, email them to get a copy. So the overview of the Inflation Reduction Act um, what they're doing is they're uh, investing a whole bunch of money in energy security to try to combat uh, climate change over the next year. It's for commercial and residential geothermal products. There's two parts associated with it. The first part has to do with rebates. You know, rebates all interchange with tax incentives and credits. 
These range from 30 to 50% of the project costs. I'll go over a couple of uh, details of how you can accomplish that. And then the second part has to do with uh, accelerated de de depreciation. What they're trying to do is they're trying to lower, with the geothermal system is lower energy costs, reduce carbon emissions, increase, increase uh, green energy. And then the objective of this Inflation Reduction Act is to reduce the uh, first cost of geothermal systems, trying to make them more attractive. I'm not going to really go over to too much of the next two slides, but just uh, you know reasons why um, you know geothermal uh, systems uh, you know are beneficial in this situation, uh, trying to reduce uh, energy costs. Um, you know, energy security concerns. Everybody's aware of the uh, situation with the Ukraine war. Uh, electrical grid, um, you know, blackouts out in California, et cetera, like that. And then other reasons why geothermal. Geothermal is a good candidate because it's available. It's been installed in all 50 states. We're addressing, um, you know, uh, HVAC uh, equipment uh, or, you know, HVAC heating and energy consumption is a very large uh, component of the, um, of the energy that's used, uh, you know, can use domestic Technology uh, system uh, is uh, helping at peak uh, loads and then uh, going towards the trend of electrification that everybody is familiar with. Okay, so let's go through uh, some of what the uh, uh, tax incentives, what the IRA is, is, is uh, covering. All right, so um, what does a rebate typically cover? It's covering labor materials for all these components. Uh, interesting fact is that it's also including uh, costs associated with the hybrid system, these heat projection devices that I talked about previously, and then also not just the HVAC equipment, but they're also allowing the condensate piping to be, uh, to be covered. Um, they'll prorate the portion of the electrical power that's uh, associated with the geothermal equipment as well as uh, some design fees for consultant engineers, contractors, et cetera, like that, and then uh, uh, fees associated with uh, general contracting work. So the tax incentive have uh, uh, two tiers. There's a base rate and a bonus rate. Uh, here's a simple chart where basically the base rate is uh, one level and then the bonus rates are up to five times. So get to the first 30% uh, bonus rate. You have to have um, your uh, system has to be uh, less than one megawatt of energy. There's some confusion just in the, uh, the tax of just what constitutes, uh, what's the tonnage associated with that uh, one megawatt of energy. If you do the math, is it 285 tons? Or if you do uh, consider diversification, is this uh, really a 450 ton system? There's certain, uh, you know, as the slide says, there's certain prevailing wage rates and apprenticeship requirements. And then just the project has to be started by 2022. The next to go from 30 up to 50%. The first part is a made in USA. 40% uh, of the cost of iron, steel, et cetera, like that has to be produced in the uh, United States. We go from 40 to 50, there's a, 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 a component called the energy community. Uh, my opinion, this might be difficult to achieve. Uh, it's it's uh, associated with uh, five different locations. The first one is an EPA designated brownfield site, uh, some place that everybody's aware that had uh, cooties um, that they, uh, you know, government came in and uh, cleaned up. The other four eligible locations, you know, probably kind of maybe hard to find, maybe not so much up in uh, Pennsylvania, but they're all related to the coal, uh, oil, and natural gas, you know, fossil fuel industries. The last incentive opportunity uh, has to do with uh, the federal has a 197D uh, uh, tax deduction uh, code where if you essentially beat uh, ASHRAE 90.1 efficiencies by certain uh, uh, efficiencies, you get different rebate levels for your uh, HVAC equipment. And then as well as on top of all these tax credit, a lot of states and local utilities have uh, additional tax credits or rebates. 
uh, NYSERDA in New Jersey uh, is a well-known uh, one that's been in place for a number of years. So in addition uh, to the tax credit, they've also made the, um, the tax incentives available to uh, entities that don't pay taxes, you know, very uh, interesting. Uh, some examples of nonprofits, uh, you know, nonprofits, uh, schools, uh, you know, Indian tribes, the TVA is a trans uh, Tennessee Valley authority associated with the uh, electric, you know, work that was done, you know, probably back in the 40s, if I remember my history correctly. All right. So that was the tax incentive. The second part has to do with accelerated depreciation of what they're qualifying, calling energy pop properties, okay, such as geothermal. Once again, they're trying to encourage uh, capital spending on geothermal systems. Just from Estopia, my uh, you know high school level um, understanding of finance, uh, depreciation is an accounting method used to uh, allocate the cost of a physical asset over its useful life. Uh, basically, it's how much of the asset's value has been used. So you spend it at uh, X number of years at year one and then depreciate it uh, over the life of the equipment. Um, what uh, companies use this for uh, improvements in their finances and tax situations. Um, and then, as I said, you know, the sentence there just uh, instead of you know, realizing the cost all at once, they can spread out the cost at this percentages over these number of years. And then just traditional HVAC systems, not really sure why this is the case, but typically HVAC systems can only depreciate, be used to straight line depreciation over a 39 year period, um, be uh, very hard pressed to find um, any HVAC system that does last for uh, 39 years. You know, just interesting, <laughs> interesting uh, choice that they picked. All right, so with the uh, accelerated depreciation, you have two choices to uh, choose from. The first one is a five-year modified accelerated cost recovery system, or the second one is a bonus depreciation where you can you know, uh, take the appreciation uh, value, 80% of uh, the value in 2023, and then as they uh, go down, um, they, they reduce it by 20%. Uh, eligible projects for this, the building essentially has to be located in the USA and then construction you know, off that far in the future. And then the original use uh, once again begins with the taxpayer. So um, Climate Master uh, has created a uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, that uh, is being used to try to show the benefits of a geothermal uh, HVAC system versus other systems. We'll send this out uh, to all the uh, you know attendees, signups, etc. So this Excel spreadsheet before IRA was used to calculate uh, you know basically what's a simple payback. Uh, you'll have additional costs associated with the geothermal system. You can plug in your rebates. You can uh, plug in your income tax rates, and then you'll plug in how much energy the geothermal saved, and then generate a, a simple payback. So now with the implementation of the IRA, you'll still use the same uh, information up above, but you also have additional benefits where you can uh, you know, follow the IRA with the two uh, items, you know, a tax credit to reduce the first cost. You know, we talked about uh, you know, how to get the 30% uh, quickly, how to just we get the 10 and the extra 10, and then also talked about the uh, accelerated depreciation that's available. So two examples that um, Climate Master has uh, in the presentation. The first one is a nonprofit um, where you have a 34,000 square foot office building at 113 tons. They calculated the geothermal water source heat pump cost, comparing it to a traditional rooftop unit, a VAV system that had electric heat. <clears throat> the geothermal system saved $34,000 per year. And then they used a uh, energy inflation of 3%. Excuse me. So back in 2015, when this project went ahead, they showed, <clears throat> they depicted a simple payback of 5.2 years. If you take that same project using the RRA, you were able to uh, add $125,000 to the construction costs, 
associated with the uh, you know, electrical power wiring, the design and the GC work. This project here would have qualified for the 30% uh, energy credit, as well as the 10% US content. They took the special depreciation path. This project here then had an immediate uh, payback with that much money saved in the first year. <clears throat> the second example that they used was a, a large uh, oil uh, company out in uh, Oklahoma called Gulfport Energy. This was for a six story office building. The load was approximately 400 tons. The geothermal system had a $409,000 additional cost, once again, versus a traditional uh, BAV system, but this one did have fan powered VAVs. Uh, interesting fact is that uh, the utility uh, you know, company uh, issued a, a rebate of $237,000. And then back then they did use uh, the 50, uh, you know, the, the special depreciation that was uh, available for this project. They estimated that the geothermal uh, system had $71,000 of energy costs. And then just a, uh, you know, myself uh, can't help being cheeky, <laughs> but there's a, a picture of uh, four people holding a, uh, that incentive check. Uh, you know, just laugh to myself that as if you're the building owner, you're very happy. And then I can't imagine that you're the electrical, uh, <laughs> you're the electrical utility and you're off, you're handing, holding a check that you're giving to somebody for $237 that you have really that big of a smile on your face. But anyway, sorry, just can't help being cheeky. <laughs> so back in 2016, uh, with the incentive and then the, uh, the depreciation, they had an immediate payback. If you did that same project today using the IRA with the uh, you know the additional uh, credit or rebate for the uh, energy content as well as the U.S. forty uh, percent uh, U.S. Um, uh, iron, steel, et cetera, made in the United States, this one had a much greater um, you know immediate payback once again. And then just this geothermal uh, Excel spreadsheet is actually being used to um, you know, for years now to help sell geothermal products versus traditional system. And then uh, it has uh, helped sell a lot of uh, much smaller projects that you traditionally wouldn't think that water source heat pumps would be a, uh, a, a an attractive uh, solution to your uh, HVAC system. Okay, last couple of slides, just gonna uh, go over what HCNI slash Gilbar has available. Just back in September, HCNI did uh, merge with Gilbar Solutions. From the sales perspective, we like that uh, we had approximately, you know, this number of vendors, and we have more items to sell. One of the items that we, uh, you know, recently uh, expanded our territory was for was uh, NK Plastics. Uh, there's the uh, website. Sorry, there's a website there with the uh, information about HCNI. All should be familiar with. So just for water source heat pumps, uh, main uh, product that we represent is Climate Master. They've been in business for, uh, you know, as the slide says, a very long time. They're situated in Oklahoma City. They have all these different types of units that are available, um, you know, depicted there on the, uh, the uh, screen. They also have a plethora of uh, simple to complex uh, controls for your water source heat pumps with uh, interconnectivity and uh, Wi-Fi and uh, remote monitoring, et cetera, like that. Aon, um, also out in uh, Oklahoma, makes uh, geothermal uh, water source heat pump systems from two to 230 tons as a rooftop unit, all those different types of sequence of operation. Aon strength for years has been factory installed uh, controls, you know, different uh, sequence of operation, special orders, et cetera, like that. They also have self-contained uh, indoor units as shown there uh, from three to 70 tons. And um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Aon for years has been strong with um, you know, those solutions. <clears throat> Next uh, couple, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, products have available. First one is Nortec. This is available in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. These are custom packaged DX units. A few operating, a few manufacturing facilities uh, for DX systems. They, um, you know, have these different types uh, available. 
uh, two sort of cataloged or engineered products. Uh, first one is Energy Pack, where they have custom DOAS or energy recovery up to you know those C large CFM and tonnage. That's the Energy Pack. In addition, they have a traditional air handler uh, rooftop custom line, uh, once again up to approximately the same uh, CFM, you know, supplier CFM as well as tonnages. Uh, Annex Air, uh, this is in uh, Delaware, uh, you know, Northeast and Central PA, not in Philadelphia. Uh, Annex Air is another custom uh, package DX uh, manufacturer located in Montreal, Canada. Uh, traditionally strong for years with uh, factory testing controls. Uh, they're very, very innovative. That picture there shows a um, you know, white uh, composite. It's a it's a it's a composite um, uh, panel system with uh, you know extremely long um, you know life, low leakage. Uh, you know, made from green materials, etc., like that. Annex Air for years has been you know specialized in uh, heat transfer, uh, not just single wheels, but uh, dual plates, uh, a lot of free cooling or free reheat applications, etc., like that. They have custom units um, up to 300 plus tons, all those different uh, heat transfer mediums. Um, and then once again, uh, similar to Nortec, they specialize in uh, systems that have redundancy, uh, dual air pass, uh, et cetera, like that. <clears throat> uh, additional water source heat pumps is a company called United Cool Air. Uh, there's their website located you know, locally in York, PA. They specialize in indoor self-contained units up uh, that tonnage range, those uh, mediums and systems. What it, uh, United Cool Air is well known for is modularity on their design. Uh, they make their products, uh, you know, on the larger sizes, able to fit through uh, 36-inch doorways. These are great for uh, retrofit situations. Uh, if you have a school market, just realize that Magic Air uh, makes the traditional, uh, you know, water source uh, airside heat pump UV, uh, you know, classroom ones, VFD compressors, uh, always come with standalone controls to, to ensure that the uh, system is going to operate properly. Climacool, once again, out in Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City, <laughs> a lot of uh, manufacturers out there. They are specializing in modular chillers, uh, you know, those module sizes, if you combine them together up to that tonnage. Uh, these water-cooled ones are uh, uh, for indoors, are made to fit through doorways, made for uh, redundancy, uh, easy expansion, et cetera, like that. Uh, for the water-cooled, they have uh, water source heat pumps, but then they also have heat recovery available, as well as uh, six pipe simultaneously heating and cooling systems. Those are the water cool. They also make an air cooled product that uh, you know is available as an air source heat pump. For heat projection devices, uh, we don't have cooling towers, but we do have dry uh, coolers, uh, fluid coolers, adiabatic coolers. The first one is direct coil. Uh, they have multiple arrangements that you can see from left to right. We have a uh, V bank. The uh, second one from the left is a W, where they have actually, instead of just two coils, there's four coils. Uh, if you have space constraints with uh, horizontal uh, discharge um, uh, as well. And then the one on the far right is uh, just a traditional uh, vertical uh, unit. Those are mostly dry coolers. What we found is that the V and the W bank are more commonly used just because the coil you can get more coil transfer surface for the footprint uh, versus the traditional uh, horizontal, or sorry, vertical discharge on the far right. Uh, additional uh, coolers, fluid coolers that we have available is a company called Technical Systems. Oh, look, they're out of Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, these are a little bit more customizable um, where you can add acoustic tr treatments, uh, special construction, they have, uh, you know, uh, bolt-on uh, pumps and uh, storage tanks, uh, you know, glycol feeders, et cetera, like that. Technical Systems uh, has a nice factory where they make sure they factory test all these custom units before they uh, leave. You know, it's great from uh, an owner's perspective, but then also us salespeople like this fact too. We, we like when, um, you know, equipment uh, ships from the factory and it uh, works properly. 
All right, last couple of slides or, or slide here at the end, uh, just for today's presentation, went over a uh, simple review of just water source heat pump systems. Um, some considerations just to think of is, you know, how about one pipe systems? You uh, do need dividification. You have choices of your uh, water source heat pump level at the DOAS, trying to encourage you to uh, try to use a DOAS for that. Um, you know, to try to uh, help with additional geothermal systems, we showed you a, a hybrid type where we're taking a, a fluid cooler in conjunction with our geothermal system. Uh, last two items were just, uh, you know, tried to review in 15 minutes the uh, the 800 page Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act uh, that's trying to promote the use of geothermal systems. And then once again, to emphasize that uh, we are salespeople, but we're trying to, uh, you know, work with, um, you know, selling or just solving system problems, uh, you know, uh, selling stuff, making sure it works. Uh, right, uh, you know, uh, works afterwards. Uh, we don't have many callbacks and sort of like that, and we're going on to the next job. Uh, okay, just, uh, you know, so uh, we'll send out the questions that were asked. Just once again, a reminder that uh, we do have a survey available. Uh, if you have any additional needs for PDH, please uh, email me, we'll get that out to you. And then um, we will send out a nice little package of the information that we talked about in our presentation today. And then just uh, on April 25th, we have a, uh, I'll be the presenter for a single pipe hydronic systems that I touched on a little bit there. And then still trying to pick a date, probably to sit the 13th, we'll go over indoor package uh, systems, you know, trying to, to tie into the, um, you know, United uh, Cool Air uh, products that are mentioned uh, here. Uh, you know, mostly used for retrofit applications, but could be new design. So, all right, and uh, that's it. Once again, thank you all for attending. Um, I do appreciate the time that you guys, uh, you know, uh, take to uh, spend with us. All right, thank you. Have a good day.